We're going to talk about cities tonight, in particular this one. Um, David Owen, you know, has um, written this book, Green Metropolis, um, and he's going to talk to us about some of that content and why New York, particularly Manhattan, is such a special place to feel good about. Um, also, Andrea Lips, who's one, a member of our curatorial team, after David has spoken, will show a few slides of um, some other cities that are part of our research for our upcoming exhibition. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, before uh, Andrea starts. Um, David, you know, he's been writing for The New Yorker almost 20 years. He started in 1991. He's written a dozen books of this, I think, is the most recent one. Um, but he really is an author of uh, incredible repute and merit, and it's a thrill to have him here. So please welcome David Ern. Thank you very much. The uh, subject of every talk about the environment is really energy. And uh, I have a horrifying fact for you that, about energy. We're all appalled by the oil spill in the Gulf. And the most recent uh, estimate I heard of how much oil has been spewing out of it was 50,000 barrels a day. And to put that number in perspective, uh, Americans, we Americans, uh, go through 50,000 barrels every nine minutes uh, in this country. The world goes through 50,000 barrels every two minutes and 15 seconds. So on the scale of uh, the uh, environmental damage we do with oil, probably what we use is uh, more significant than what we spill. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about my background in these issues. Uh, when I've been writing for The New Yorker for 20 years, I've been married for 32 years, and my wife and I, uh, when we got married, we got married right out of college, and we were young and idealistic, and we spent the first seven years of our married life living in a utopian uh, environmentalist community in the northeastern United States. We lived in a very small living space, just 700 square feet. We didn't own a car. Uh, we didn't have a lawn. We didn't have a clothes dryer. When uh, we did our grocery shopping on foot, we, uh, when we had to travel long, longer distances, we used public transportation. And our electric bill worked out to about a dollar a day. Uh, that utopian community was Manhattan. Our apartment was on 69th and 2nd in a 14-story building. And uh, most, uh, most people, especially even, or including, and even especially, most New Yorkers don't think of uh, New York City this way. They think of it as a, uh, as a, a horrible environmental problem, as, a, as just all concrete and diesel fumes and traffic jams. But actually, by the most significant measures, New York City is the greenest place in the United States and one of the greenest in the world. Uh, some, some numbers. Uh, the average Manhattanite consumes about 90 gallons of gasoline a year, which is a rate that the country as a whole hasn't matched since the mid-1920s, when the most widely owned car in the US was the Model T Ford. The national average uh, in the US is 454 gallons per person. Uh, that's uh, five times Manhattan's average and three times New York City's. 82% of Manhattan, uh, employed Manhattan residents uh, get to work by public transit, uh, by walking or by riding bikes. Uh, that is 10 times the national rate and uh, eight times the rate for workers in Los Angeles County. Uh, New York City residents individually use less energy in all categories uh, than any other Americans. New York City is more populous than all but 11 states. Uh, if it were granted statehood, it would rank uh, 51st, last, in uh, per capita energy use. Uh, the uh, average New York City resident, uh, or average New York City household, uses about uh, 4,700 kilowatt hours of electricity every year. The average Dallas household uh, uses 16,000 uh, kilowatt hours. Uh, as a result of all these things, New Yorkers have not only the smallest energy footprint, but also the smallest carbon footprint in the country. The average New Yorker's carb carbon footprint is about 7.1 uh, metric tons uh, per year. The uh, US average is about 24 and a half tons. The uh, average Manhattanites is even smaller than the average New Yorkers. It's about the same as the average Swedes. 
Despite all this, uh, in 2007, Forbes picked uh, Vermont as the greenest state in the country. Uh, and it's a choice consistent with uh, conventional thinking about what green is. Vermont has uh, lots of trees and farms and uh, backyard compost heaps, and it has many environmentally aware citizens, and it has no crowded, big, dirty cities. Uh, the, in fact, the population of Vermont's largest city, Burlington, is just, uh, just under 40,000. Uh, Vermont also ranks high in all the categories that Forbes uh, based its analysis on, uh, such as the proportion of buildings certified by the U.S. Green Building Council's uh, uh, eco rating system, the LEED system. Uh, but Forbes' uh, ranking was unfortunate, in my view, because uh, Vermont, in many ways, sets a poor environmental example. Uh, it ranks low in comparison with uh, many other American places. It has no truly significant public transit system, other than its school bus network. It has, uh, it's one of the most heavily automobile dependent uh, states in the country. A typical Vermonter consumes 545 gallons of gasoline per year, which is uh, 100 gallons over the national average. Uh, and the average household in Vermont consumes 7,100 kilowatt hours uh, per, uh, uh, in comparison with 4,700 uh, 4, in New York City. And uh, uh, Vermonters also use more water and uh, generate more solid waste, uh, backyard compost heaps notwithstanding. Uh, I don't live in Vermont, but I live uh, similarly. My wife and I, uh, after our seven years in New York, uh, our daughter turned one and we decided to uh, flee the city the way people often do. In 1985, we moved 90 miles north of Manhattan. We moved into a house that was built in 1790. Uh, it's uh, directly across a dirt road from a 4,000 acre nature preserve. I've seen a bear in my yard, uh, a bear in my neighbor's yard, eating, a, 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 treating a, um, one of those cylindrical L.L. Bean bird feeders like a pixie stick, uh, just uh, draining it into his throat. Our electricity use went from 4,000 kilowatt hours a year uh, in our final year in New York City in 1985 to almost 30,000 kilowatt hours and uh, our house doesn't even have uh, uh, central air conditioning. When we lived in New York, we didn't have a car. When we moved to the country, we bought a car and then immediately re realized that one car wasn't enough because what we discovered was that when your car is at the mechanic, you can't go and get it unless you have another car. And so we got a second car almost immediately and then uh, as a result of uh, a mild midlife crisis on my part, we ended up with a third car. And then when our children uh, got old enough to drive, that car became a necessity. When uh, people who live in the city think about life in the country, they picture uh, people going for walks in the woods and going kayaking in, uh, in uh, streams and gathering eggs from their own chickens. But what you really do when you move to the country is move into a car uh, and you move your children into car seats because there's no public transit and because there's no place close enough uh, to, uh, to go on foot. When we lived in Manhattan, our pediatrician was in the, uh, our pediatrician's office was in the lobby of our apartment building, just an elevator ride away, uh, so close that it didn't uh, really encourage uh, independent uh, parenting for my <laughs> wife and me. But very energy efficient. Elevators are extraordinarily energy efficient uh, passenger vehicles since uh, part of the work is done by counterweighting. Where we live now uh, in Connecticut, I'm ashamed to say, my dentist, uh, who I just visited a couple of days ago, is two towns away, a 32 mile round trip uh, car trip. Uh, the nearest movie theater to our house is uh, 20 minutes away, same with the nearest large supermarket. Uh, renting a DVD back when people used to do that consumed almost two gallons of gasoline because the nearest blockbuster was 10 miles away and renting a DVD involved two round trips. Uh, the, the explanation, the difference between uh, how we lived in the city and, and how we live, have lived ever since is density. Uh, the very thing that's, that to most people makes uh, life in, in the city look like an ecological problem. Manhattan's density is extraordinary. It's about 67,000 people per square mile, which is 800 times the US average. 
that's 30 times Los Angeles's, uh, uh, 16 times Melbourne, Australia, that's where I uh, visited recently, five times Chicago's, it's 1,000 times Vermont's. The, if you took all uh, 8.2 million New Yorkers and spread them out, in fact, at the density of Vermont, you would need a space equal to the land area of the six New England states, uh, so Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, and I think there's maybe another one in there, uh, plus uh, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. And then, of course, you'd have to think of something to do with all the people you'd be displacing, and you'd have to create the infrastructure that it would take to support all those people. Um, the, the reason for that is that along with all those uh, uh, square miles, you would requ we would require uh, a vastly expanded and inefficient network of, uh, of roads and gas stations and power plants and transmission lines and uh, water, uh, uh, sewer, sewage treatment facilities and water, water mains, all the stuff, uh, shopping centers, schools, hospitals, all the stuff that our suburbs are filled with, that, which is kind of the energy consuming, carbon belching uh, mantle of infrastructure that we drag behind us wherever we go. Uh, one of the, the, the things that, that I've argued is that the, 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 the environmental problem with our sprawling countryside, with our sprawling suburbs, it's not the Hummer in the driveway, it's the driveway. It's everything that the Hummer makes possible. It's everything that we pull behind us when we, when we spread out. By contrast, moving people closer together, the way they are in uh, urban cores, reduces the distance between, uh, them, between them and their neighbors and also between them and their daily destinations. I gave a talk in, uh, in, in Portland, Oregon, where someone, uh, which is not a particularly dense uh, city and a, and a heavily automobile dependent uh, city, where one of the people in the audience suggested a, 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 a telling, what I think is a good measure of, to determine the walkability of a, of a place where people live, and that is your ability to walk to a grocery store. Uh, and, and I think that's true. If you live, if you live within walking distance of a, of a grocery store, you can probably live without a car, or at least live without a car to the extent that New Yorkers do. 77% of Manhattan households uh, don't own even one automobile. 54% of New York City households don't own even one automobile. In the rest of the country, it's basically 0%. Uh, in uh, 2000, we crossed a sort of dark threshold in our relationship with the automobile. In, in that year, for the first time in history, the number of registered automobiles in the country uh, exceeded the number of licensed drivers. That year, we, for the first time, we had more cars than people to drive them. Moving people closer together also forces them to live in the uh, most uh, energy efficient and sustainable residential structures we've come up with yet, apartment buildings. Uh, in the rest of the country, the trend has been in the opposite direction. Since uh, the 1950s, when I was born, the size of the average American house has doubled. Uh, and the consequence of that is not only the additional materials that go into constructing those places to live, but also the uh, additional material and energy that goes into furnishing them, and then the uh, additional energy that goes into uh, conditioning those living spaces to heating them and cooling them to, uh, throughout the year, uh, and then the, the energy and the material that goes into maintaining them, while New Yorkers crammed into their tiny places are uh, by far the most uh, space efficient Americans. Uh, those of you who live in Manhattan won't be familiar with this uh, problem, but there are parts of uh, uh, the house that my wife and I live in that we visit really only to vacuum. Now that, our, now that my daughter has, has turned into an adult and actually now lives in Manhattan in an apartment that is uh, about the same size as, the bedroom, as her childhood bedroom, uh, and my son, although he's temporarily back after graduating from college, I expect him to be gone in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's really just the two, the two of us in, this, in, in a house that, uh, that seemed liberating when we moved into it and now seems like a, a, a stone around our neck. Um, 
dense places like Manhattan are really the, the, the last places in America where walking uh, is a primary mode of transportation. New Yorkers are just about the only Americans. There's, some, there's a, a few other places. Uh, downtown Boston, uh, parts of San Francisco, many college campuses where uh, walking is actually a, a primary mode of transportation. It's not, uh, not true in, in really any other places in our country. Moving people closer together also makes public transit work. In fact, it's the only thing that makes public transit work. We've heard lots and lots of talk about our need for public transit, but in order to make public transit function, in order to make it f efficient, and in order for, to make people use it, you have to move the people and their destinations close enough together to make it efficient. Uh, the, New York City is one of the few places in the country where that's actually the case. Uh, in fact, New York City, uh, metropolitan New York City, accounts for almost a third of all the public transit passenger miles traveled in the United States. New York City has half of all the subway stops. Uh, it's, there are uh, 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 a few other places, I, I, I don't know the exact statistic on it, but there's a bus route in New York City that uh, each year accounts for more, uh, pe more public transit passenger miles than the second largest bus, bus system in the, in the United States. New York City has uh, 100 times as many uh, transit passenger miles uh, each year as uh, Phoenix, Arizona, one of the fastest growing cities in the country. Um, I'm going to look through my pile to find what the rest of what I was going to tell you. Um, Density obviously has a downside. As I was saying in response to a question I heard a couple of days ago, uh, density makes disasters more efficient too, uh, in addition uh, to making people. Uh, diseases travel faster. Uh, biological warfare would be more effective in a dense city. Uh, the, uh, the effects of, uh, there are many effects of uh, climate change that will be felt more uh, severely in, in cities. One of them in New York City that will be felt acutely is uh, the rising sea levels. The New York City uh, storm and sewer system, storm water and sewer systems uh, currently have a problem even in heavy rains. They, mer they flow together and then terrible things flow out into the rivers. Uh, a, a, a sea level rise of just a few inches would, would uh, incapacitate the entire system. Nevertheless, uh, in terms of many of the, the environmental problems that we talk about, many of the energy problems we talk about, uh, there's the, the only uh, solution, the only uh, clear uh, and obvious solution is to uh, move people and their destinations closer together uh, rather than doing what we've done for the past hundred years and, 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 sp and basically spread out. The, I uh, was, attended the uh, World Science Fair in New York a couple of years ago and was sitting next to someone in the audience and, and explained to him this book that I was working on and explained the basic idea of it. And he was, looked all angry and said, he said, but that's just because New Yorkers are all crammed together. And I said, well, yeah, that's, that's sort of the, the point. And he said, he, said, he said, yeah, but all that energy efficiency is, is completely unconscious. And I said, well, that's really the beauty of it. The, 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 because the uh, New Yorkers don't use the, aren't the lowest per capita energy users and carbon emitters in the United States because they have uh, a, the special green consciousness that the rest of America doesn't have. Most of them are entirely unaware of their small energy and carbon footprints. They, their relatively uh, low impact lives are just a structural result of the way they live. And the best solutions to the problems that we, uh, the considerable problems that we face are going to be solutions of that kind that uh, harness human nature rather than uh, trying to change it. We are uh, very good at uh, fooling ourselves about uh, things like the environment. Most of the solutions that we talk about are uh, not only don't, think, don't make things better, but probably in the long run make things worse. We all want to, uh, Americans I think uh, in particular, we're eager to, we'll, we're eager to 
sign on to solutions that involve buying things. You know, happy to buy a new car, happy to redo my kitchen with uh, bamboo on the floor instead of um, linole, instead of, well, maybe instead of uh, vinyl. Uh, happy to have uh, used soy foam insulation in my new renovation of my house. But we're much, uh, we're much worse at, at less, at, 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 uh, uh, at solutions that, that involve actual less. And one of my, the, there, I have a friend who recently bought, a New Yorker in fact, who bought a uh, Ford Fusion automobile a gas electric hybrid. And the Ford Fusion on the dashboard has a little uh, uh, display that as you drive in a particularly fuel efficient manner, it uh, shows little leaves, green leaves appear on the on the display, and the effect of it as you drive is to feel that you are actively doing something beneficial to the, uh, to the earth as you drive along and make the green leaves appear. There's a Prius commercial, a Toyota Prius commercial that has the same effect. That the, I'm sure you've seen it. It uh, shows a, a gray, colorless landscape, uh, just bleak and nothing. And then a Prius drives across this landscape, and as it passes, the gray bursts into uh, color and flowers blossom and children, children pop up and are smiling. And there is this feeling that as, as the sort of Prius drives through the, the countryside is kind of vacuuming bad things out of, the, out of our environment and replacing them with good things. The, uh, one of the most, uh, I think that one of the most popular, mysteriously popular uh, steps that people have been willing to take lately in order to save the earth is to raise chickens. And uh, I, my New Yorker colleague, Susan Orlean, has been a, an evangelist of chicken raising. And uh, she uh, has a number of chickens at her house and has written about them in the magazine. But Susan, uh, I think like many people, many uh, hobby chicken raisers, uh, drives individual chickens to the veterinarian uh, when they get sick. And uh, uh, a fact that gives her eggs a carbon footprint that is so far beyond uh, <laughs> anything that you could find at the grocery store that, that, that it's all negated. Um, I have a very short uh, slideshow. It's the, the, it's the world's uh, second shortest uh, PowerPoint presentation. The, I also have the short world's shortest uh, PowerPoint presentation because I, I gave a talk once where I didn't have my two slides, and so I just, I just pointed at the wall and described them. But uh, this first uh, slide is of a, uh, it's actually not a real traffic jam. It was created uh, for the purpose of taking this photograph in Tampa of about 15 years ago. The, Tampa was exploring the possibility of uh, building a, a uh, transit system, I think a light rail system, which I, I believe they actually built. And uh, so this is, but we all recognize this a typical street scene uh, filled with cars. The second slide, the other half of my PowerPoint presentation, is all the, the they then removed the cars, they took all the occupants out of the cars and they sat them in chairs in the street. <laughs> so that's all the people who were in the cars uh, that you saw here. The, this is horrifying and it makes you think, I mean, these people, this group of people right here wouldn't even fill the back half of a typical city bus. But the, these two slides also demonstrate one of the, the tremendous difficulties that we face, which is that if you're the driver of one of these cars, uh, when you look at this, you see a street that looks very inviting to you as a driver. Uh, suddenly, your, uh, the problem that made you hate your car has been solved for you. Uh, the street is clear again. All those other cars are gone. And you're happy to get back into your car. And that, in a, in a nutshell, is the history of the growth of our, of our road system. The, uh, one of the things that, you, if you ask people what are, their, what are the major uh, environmental problems uh, that, they, that they see, that they would like to be solved. Traffic congestion is one of them. And I'm one of the uh, few proponents of traffic congestion. Uh, I'm probably the only defender of traffic congestion as an environmental good uh, in the country. 
The reason is that uh, traffic congestion isn't an environmental problem, it's a driving problem. And to the extent that drivers see it as a problem, and to the extent that it discourages them from driving, it has environmental value. So what we need to do, I, in, in my opinion, is to do what New York City has uh, unconsciously done, which is to uh, maintain a, uh, a, an infuriating level of traffic congestion at, very, at what are actually, on a per capita basis, very low traffic volumes. Uh, in fact, I think, especially in New York City, traffic congestion is under, underappreciated uh, because the, I think the, the, speed, the average speed on a crosstown street in Manhattan is about one mile an hour. Uh, and anybody who's, anybody, everybody here has had this experience. Anybody who's visited Manhattan has had the experience of uh, sitting in a taxi cab on Fifth Avenue or someplace and watching a uh, little old lady on the sidewalk uh, <laughs> overtake the cab and disappear over the horizon. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an experience that makes you hate your car, or hate cars and make you want to get out. And uh, in Manhattan is one of the few places, in fact, where uh, even public transit often uh, creates that kind of uh, uh, frustration where even public transit begins to seem inefficient and people simply walk. Uh, the, what we need to do if, if we're serious about uh, public transit is not only to create the bus line that this picture makes us think we need, but also to have the courage to eliminate the uh, automobile capacity that surrounds those drivers. Do we leave just enough room for the buses and to maintain that level of frustration for the people who continue to drive? The uh, crucial fact about um, sustainability, in my view, is that it's uh, not a micro phenomenon. Uh, it's a macro phenomenon. It's a system uh, issue. There can be no such thing as a sustainable house or office building uh, or a household appliance or even a sustainable city for the same reason that there uh, can be no such thing as a one person democracy or a, a single company economy. Uh, every house, office building, and appliance, no matter where they are, uh, no matter where their power comes from, uh, no matter how many of their parts are made from soybeans, uh, is just a single element in a civilization-wide network of deeply uh, interdependent relationships. And it's those relationships and not the individual constituents on which sustainability depends. Uh, sustainability is a, concept, is, is a context, not a gadget or a technology. Uh, recently, in a recent issue of The New Yorker, I uh, wrote a profile of a, of, of a really uh, brilliant young inventor named Saul Griffith. He's an uh, engineer from uh, MIT, and he's been working on, among many other things, uh, an innovative way of, of, of harness, harnessing wind power. Uh, he has estimated that the, that the Earth, uh, that the human race, currently consumes energy at an average rate of approximately 16 trillion watts, uh, 16 terawatts, which is the equivalent of 160 billion 100 watt light bulbs uh, burning all the time. Uh, he's estimated that capping atmospheric greenhouse gases at 450 parts per million, that's uh, 60 parts per million higher than where we are now, and is a level that uh, scientists have often talked about as one that's consistent with holding global warming at an additional two degrees centigrade, which is one of the, the sort of red line uh, uh, danger points that people have identified. Uh, capping atmospheric uh, greenhouse gases at, at 450 parts per, per million, he, he estimates, would necessitate holding global energy consumption at that 16 trillion watts and replacing all but three of the 16 uh, trillion watts with uh, some combination of uh, over the next 25 years with some combination of uh, the most promising renewable and non-carbon energy resources. Uh, that would be photovoltaics, solar thermal, which is where you use uh, sunlight to heat up liquid instead of to generate electricity uh, directly, wind, uh, biofuels, geothermal, and nuclear fission. Uh, and doing that, Griffith, Griffith has estimated, would require building uh, between now and 2035 the equivalent of all of the following 100 square meters of new solar cells, 50 square meters of new solar thermal reflectors, and one Olympic swimming pool's volume of genetically engineered algae for, for biofuels every second for the next 25 years, uh, one 300-foot diameter wind turbine every five minutes, 
one 100 megawatt uh, geothermal powered steam engine, uh, steam turbine every eight hours, and one three gigawatt nuclear power plant every week. Uh, such a construction program, he says, is theoretically feasible, but the uh, practicalities are daunting. Uh, the, currently, nuclear power plants are there are only, I think there are three, ap uh, three dozen applications and they take years. The, uh, the wind installation that was uh, recently approved for um, Nantucket Sound off of uh, Hyannis Port uh, was, uh, took a decade to get to the point that it is and it's not clear that it will ever be built. I think that uh, these are the reasons why dense cities, and especially in this country, Manhattan and New York City, set such an important example. Uh, there are ways to, uh, that don't depend on technology, that are, structural, that are structural ways to organize human beings in, in ways that are inherently uh, less uh, destructive to the environment, or her inherently less energy, uh, the, less energy Con consumptive, if that's the correct word, uh, and that's, that produce uh, fewer greenhouse gases. Uh, the, the lesson that I learned, uh, although I haven't quite found a way to apply it in my own life, when my <laughs> wife and I moved away from the city is that uh, density scales and uh, sprawl doesn't. It was in fact while uh, thinking about our life in Connecticut that I thought you can't multiply this times 330 million and, and pull it off, whereas uh, New York City, it looks like something like a model uh, for, for the rest of the world. And thank you very much. You know, I, I'm really pleased to be here in New York, um, having come from the mountains <laughs> of California, living in a big house, um, but now I feel good about it. <laughs> um, so upstairs we have uh, our triennial exhibition, um, why, why Design Now? Um, it's going to run um, until the rest, the end of this year. And Andrea Lipp, who, uh, Lips, who's one of our curatorial team, has been really active in researching everything about that show. So she knows the answer to almost any question about any of the pieces, the 134 pieces that are on show there. But not only that, um, a show that we're going to have next year called Critical Mass is looking at the dense cities largely in the southern hemisphere and looking at the design opportunities that have been emerging um, uh, there in those situations. Um, and uh, Cynthia Smith is currently traveling in order to study um, these places and she's been working again with Andrea um, on researching um, these areas of the world. So. Um, I'm very pleased that Andrea can just add a few comments uh, in that initial research and give you a few examples of these dense cities around the world to sort of be a complement to what David has uh, told us. So here's Andrea Lips. As Bill had mentioned, of course, uh, the triennial upstairs does touch upon uh, many of these issues, many of the projects, and the triennial upstairs does. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to take a look at the show yet, I would very much encourage you uh, to do so. Um, just a couple examples really quickly, of course, are uh, Weber Thompson's Eco Laboratory, which is a vertical farm concept for urban areas in which crops are farmed in uh, the controlled environment of a multi-story building. And so this then allows for increased organic food production, um, but then also uh, lessens the impact on the environment. And uh, MIT's city car um, is also uh, just another concept that, that touches upon these issues. It provides an alternative to private car ownership. Um, really by introducing what is a, a new vehicle typology and mobility on demand system to encourage this notion of, of shared use for short distance travel in urban areas. Um, but turning back to, uh, to this idea of density, um, as Bill had mentioned, we are exploring density uh, with an upcoming exhibition. Um, but we're looking at density in a slightly different context than how it can contribute to a sustainable lifestyle. We're looking at density of expanding populations in informal communities. The world today is 
becoming more urban. Uh, as of, I believe, 2006, the world is now, uh, over half the world's population is now living in urban areas. And as we heard from David, this could be a really good thing so long as we're following models laid out by New York rather than vast, sprawling urban and suburban areas of, say, Dallas or, or Phoenix. Um, so with the world rapidly urbanizing, there, there definitely are a lot of lessons to, uh, to be learned by looking at locations that are dealing with dense living conditions. And so this is a topic that a uh, curator of socially responsible design, Cynthia Smith, and myself are examining with this upcoming exhibition, Critical Mass, which is uh, scheduled to open next year in 2011. Um, as I mentioned, we of course are looking for design solutions for these dense populations in informal communities, primarily in the global south. And you of course see one here up on the screen um, in Mumbai in India. And we're currently in the exhibition's research stage, uh, which has taken Cynthia to Asia, to South and Central America, and uh, currently she's in, in uh, Africa, where she's conducting field research. So a lot of the images that you're going to see here tonight are, are those that she's taken over the course of her travels. As just a brief bit of background, uh, Critical Mass is actually the second exhibition in the design feed of the 90% program series, which began here at the museum in, in 2007 with the exhibition that presented design solutions to address the needs of the underserved populations around the world. So with critical mass, we're examining design solutions that address the challenges and the critical issues that uh, are arising with this unprecedented rate of urban growth. Um, right now, there are one billion people who live in informal communities around the world. And by 2030, that number is projected to swell to 2 billion people. So it's expected to, uh, to double in just the next 20 years. So um, this is really a, a huge influx of people moving into these, into these areas. And uh, here again on the screen, you see another image of um, an informal community, of course, with the formal city uh, in the, the background there in Dhaka in Bangladesh. And Dhaka itself has 13.6 uh, million people who live in the city, and 30 to 40 percent of those live in informal communities. And Bangladesh is actually the second most dense country in the world, with about one person per square foot. So it's a lot of people and not a lot of land mass for it. And I really think by even just looking at, at this image of this informal community, I mean, you really, it, it looks like pretty much every square foot of land mass is used, and maybe a little bit more is. There are some structures sort of jutting out into the water. Um, so informal communities are also known as favelas, as slums, as barrios, as squatter settlements, and more. Um, they're communities that lack land tenure. And they often lack adequate sanitation, um, clean water, reliable energy sources, schools, um, public transportation, and, and more. And oftentimes, informal communities develop as People migrate from rural areas to urban city centers in search of jobs and better lives. So whether they're escaping you know, the creeping desert as, as climate refugees or whether they're pulled to the city for economic opportunities, they then come to these, these city centers and build homes on land that they don't own. Uh, to present another statistic to you, every year 70 million people leave their rural homes and head to, uh, to urban cities. So that's 1.4 million people every week or 200,000 people every day. So um, there certainly is a huge, huge scale um, of, of people entering these communities that, that we need to deal with. Um, and this is an image that was taken in Manila in the Philippines. It shows an informal community that was erected in the shadow of, uh, of a mountain of trash which you see there in the background. Um, so a lot of times these homes then are just built basically anywhere there's space. Um, it, it's often on undesirable land and just using any available materials. Here you see an informal community that was built on the really steep inclines of these hills in Caracas, Venezuela. Um, and one could only imagine the climb to reach those top houses up there. And uh, here is perhaps a less established uh, informal community, which was built under an uncompleted highway overpass. Um, and you see just some shelters here that are made from scrap metal and, and plastic tarps. 
But of course, you also have more established uh, informal communities as well, um, which you can see here in, in Diadema in Brazil. And with some of these, you actually begin to see perhaps some more permanent building materials that are being used for homes, such as brick or reinforced concrete. Um, so with all of this, you really, you know, just these few images, we start to understand just the diversity that exists around informal communities. Um, throughout the world, which each have their own history, they have their own geography, their own culture, the people have their own aspirations, their own needs, and their own stories. So with all of this research that, uh, that we're doing right now, some questions, of course, are emerging, um, such as what are effective housing models? Uh, what are some successful responses to sanitation and solid waste management? How do you provide effective public transportation? Uh, in a dense informal community, in particular if it has narrow roads or if it actually has no roads at all, which many of them don't have established roadways? Or how do you connect workers in the informal community with jobs in the formal city? Uh, what are some successful models that help communities uh, to save for their future? Or what are sustainable solutions for treating garbage disposal and open space? So these are just some of the questions that are beginning to emerge for us um, as we go about this research. And we're looking for design solutions uh, that meet one or more criteria. Basically those that are informed by end users that are environmentally and in economically sustainable, uh, culturally and socially specific, um, those that can be replicable, replicable in uh, other geographic locations and or those that are scalable for increased positive impact. Um, urbanization and density are, are certainly here to stay in so far as you know, globalization and massive population growth, which are making sure of that at the moment. Um, and with the population of these informal communities set to double uh, in just the next 20 years, it's clear that the face of poverty will increasingly be urban in the years to come. But to sort of bring it back to what uh, David had, had said, um, you know, certainly urbanization and density can you know, encourage sustainability and inclusiveness and resiliency and dynamism uh, within these communities, so long as we're looking at the right models and we're prioritizing lessons that are learned from those in future development. And so those are just some of the design solutions that we're seeking to examine and display in critical mass. So, I do hope that you'll stay tuned for that show next year. Great. OK. Thank you. Well, I hope we can open it up and have comments and questions from everybody. But uh, do you have anything you know, in response to what uh, Andrea uh, said first? No. It's a, uh, <clears throat> The, uh, it's a, the world's population is a tremendous challenge. Oh, yeah. And it, it, we, we tend to, the, the population of China is, is, uh, has been, I saw a projection that's projected to rise by 100 million uh, people between now and the middle of the century. But the population of the United States has been projected to rise by 100 million between now and the middle of the century. From an environmental point of view, the world has more to fear from the Americans than from the Chinese. We, our uh, use of our energy use, our uh, carbon output, all our all the bad things that we do, uh, we do more of them than the Chinese do. In the 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 images that you have, there's there's tremendous tremendous population growth. Uh, ahead of us, and it, it's it's almost inconceivable. The the by mid-century, the population of the Earth is uh, uh, projected to increase by seven times the current population of the United States uh, by the combined population of India and China right now. So, yeah, there we don't do a very good job of handling all those people at the moment, and it's not clear that we'll figure out how to do it between now and then. Mm -hmm. We haven't even talked about water, which is, in many ways, even bigger problem. Yeah, <laughs> that's a whole other show. <laughs> <laughs> I see a comment there. I think there's a roving microphone, if you'd like to speak to that. Thank you. It was very thought-provoking. Um, 
w one question occurs to me, and I don't know if this has been part of your research at all, but I'm wondering if there have been any observations about how social relations differ in a dense community and in a, a, a more sprawling community. Uh, are there any advantages to either shape of community in terms of social relations? I think, uh, I think, there, I think that in general, people who live close to other people are more interconnected than people who live far from them. And you can, for, for example, the people will often talk about um, how in order to get people, I, I've, I've read a book about this uh, by uh, a professor, a professor who said that uh, we need in cities to build, in order to get people to go outside, we need to build greenways and, and otherwise they, they stay inside all the time. If you want to see people outside, go to a city. You can travel for miles through sub suburbia and not see anyone uh, not, who's not in a car, see anyone who's walking to a destination. Uh, you'll see people walking between buildings and, and vehicles or uh, trying to lose weight. And sometimes you'll see people working on their yard. But you don't see what you see in cities, which is people out mixing around. <coughs> People who live close to other people, to, I know that when we lived in New York, in the seven years we lived in New York, I set foot in our next door neighbor's apartment exactly once. So I think people who live in cities tend to create distance for themselves. But mostly, I think people who live outside of uh, urban places tend to live in their car and in front of their TV. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask Andrea to think about the design issues that come out of some of these places that we're looking at in other parts of the world. Because you know, if you look at the design issues that emerge from the United States and Manhattan in particular, I think the subway system is an interesting example. Um, you know, I, I blogged about uh, the antennas designed for the 456 line that goes up and down on the subway, which is a very great improvement, I think, in terms of the design of the cars and the experience of riding the subway. But then you have this ADA, the American Disabilities Act, that's been in place since the 70s, and the subway system still doesn't have elevators and ways of people who can't uh, walk up and down steps uh, to reach those subways. They have to rely on the bus systems. So, you know, other sort of examples that you've seen in that research about um, people actually using design to solve the problems that they find facing them in those environments. Yeah, certainly. And and of course it's you know, it's much different. Uh, you know, they of course are are confronting such different issues and um you know, for instance, uh, one example that I think of is um you know, trash for instance. There's, you know, there is not trash pickup or or you know, disposal and so oftentimes there're just these huge trash mounds in a lot of these communities. So, you know, but these communities then also need energy you know, with which to, you know, fuel, you know, large cook stoves and, and other things. And so, um, you know, we're finding solutions where, you know, people are really innovating in, in so far as, um, you know, creating these systems in which people gather this trash and take it to these community cookers that, um, that then is burned and they're able to use the stoves um, by just bringing in this trash. So it actually is encouraging people to clean up, um, you know, their environs, but you know, then also gives them an incentive to do so um, through the design of these community cookers. So it's yeah, certainly there's there is a lot of um, design innovation. So if only we had a, a a balcony on our apartment on Central Park West, we we could probably. Um, keep our chickens there and <laughs> burn our trash and barbecue and things like that. <laughs> yes. I, I just a uh, uh, point of information that the Walter Reed Theater will be showing a film of First Climate Refugees on July 29th in the evening. So just a point in terms of uh, the issue raised about rising sea levels. And my question to both of you is that uh, you had said, David Owen, that it's really a question of relationships, context, one person him or herself cannot be sustainable, but that raises the question of the global economy as a whole, some of the issues raised by Peter Brown, right relationships, and it seems to me that's also what we have to look at because the economy we have is antithetical to sustainability, the rise of the car opposing, city, I mean, deliberately to destroy the inner city, as you point out in your book. Uh, the, the fact that the automobile industry is such a major part of the entire American economy, which also uses plastic. So I wonder if you could both comment on how your different 
perspectives also call into question the way the entire global economy is organized. Could you, uh, before you, they start, could you just repeat that point of information? Um, oh, the, the uh, Walter Reed Theater is having a film July 29th in the evening. I think it's 6.30. It's at Lincoln Center, the first climate refugees. Okay, thank you. Uh, cars, are, cars are the central issue. Uh, cars are really the uh, everything. And one interesting thing, just how we, the way we usually think about it is, is a dead end. One of the things that Saul Griffith said to me is, he, we can think of we're at uh, 390 parts per million of uh, carbon, in, CO2 in the atmosphere right now. If 450 is the ceiling, we have, we have 60 parts per million to go. And we can think of that 60 as our, our, our carbon budget. He said, simply building 2 billion uh, all electric uh, cars, which currently would be coal powered cars, but simply building uh, 2 billion uh, zero emission, zero tailpipe emission, all electric cars, the, the manufacturing process, the materials, before you even turn them on, would consume essentially all that 60 parts per million. So the, there's not, a, there's not a, a gadget, it's not a replacement item that solves, solves the problem. Um, I don't know what does solve the problem, but uh, the, the earth probably has some solutions in, in mind for us. But, <laughs> but it's, everything is, er, everything is, uh, is, is uh, painfully more difficult than it, and complicated even than it seems. I was saying to someone that, that was saying, you know, it's clear that there are no easy answers. It's, it's, it's not clear that there are actually even hard answers. But there, if there are answers, they're, they're very hard. Like now I've, I've completely lost track of your question. <laughs> Did you? Oh, oh. Yes. Uh, and, it's, and, and there's a big problem there, too, because they're, we're bad enough. But the, we have also managed to set this example. It's a very tantalizing example. And I think one of the things that, we, you know, it's easy to, to sort of to, to be, uh, to sit in New York City and be, uh, think bad thoughts about car drivers. Cars are extraordinarily appealing. And the, another New Yorker colleague of mine, Roz Chast, the cartoonist, walked into her kitchen uh, one day when her son was 10. He's 10 years old. He looks, he's, up, he's unhappy and angry. And she said, what's the matter? And he's 10. And he said, I wish I had a car. And uh, <laughs> it's a very powerful feeling. I still like driving my car. And when I was in, in Beijing, uh, for a while, I, I had a, a, a driver who had a Buick uh, Regal. It's the, the Buick is, has disappeared from the United States, but it's an extraordinarily popular car in China. And we, I was uh, going to visit a, uh, somebody, who, going to pick up somebody who lived in a hutong, one of these ancient, like centuries, five, six century old uh, alley neighborhoods, very uh, you know, pedest entirely pedestrian and bicycle oriented, that the Chinese are now just wiping aside like this. But with this tiny little narrow alley, and I said, I, I told the driver, stop here, I'll run up. 100 yards up the alley and get him. He said, he laughed, you know, he, he, he had a car, we would drive. And to do it, we had to go up a block to, uh, to enter the, the, the alley at a different point. He had to pull the mirrors in on the, on the car to, to squeeze in. And the whole drive, as we, you know, women and cats and uh, chickens were <laughs> fleeing into doorways, the whole way he was honking, you know, get out of the way. And, and it wasn't, people weren't angry, it was like, you know, of course, it's a car. You know, it, you'll drive the car, and uh, that is that uh, is an extraordinarily powerful force, and it, it it's it's operating all over the world. India is now in the process of building this enormous uh, interstate highway system, and when we when we talk in this country, there I was mentioning to Andrea that there's there's a there's this horrible downside to almost everything, every solution, and one of the, the things we're talking about now. How do we build a, an affordable, fuel-efficient car? Well, an affordable, fuel-efficient car is a global virus. It, you make a car affordable and you, and you drive down the cost of operating it, it becomes uh, uh, acquirable everywhere in the world. And uh, so the, India and China are both, as fast as they can, transforming themselves into uh, automobile cultures and, and, and abandoning what in Beijing was a bicycle city not that long ago. And now it's, you take your life in your hands when you ride a bike. Um, 
Oh, anyway, yeah. more random comments. Well, I mean, of course, in informal communities, the reality is so much different, um, you know, than than here in, in the developed world as far as cars. I mean, I, I do think that a lot of people in informal communities do aspire to one day own a car. I mean, that really would be a sign of, of um, you know, of, of moving up and being social, you know, uh, uh, you know, upwardly mobile. Um, but of course, um, in in some of these communities, I mean, you of course actually have the opportunity to create more public transportation systems, which is really great. And uh, you know, looking at um, some of these uh, communities that have been built up, you know, on a lot of these hills, uh, metro cable systems are actually a really great way to connect people who are living, you know, way up top with you know some of the more formal city that uh, exists down below, um, which is what we're seeing. So it's interesting to think back to the history of what happened here with the car. I think uh, Norman, Norman Belgedis um, was responsible for the 1939 um, World's Fair GM Pavilion, um, where they had uh, a, a, an amazing exposition of uh, a, an imagination of a future American city, which included all these roads, um, and also a map of the United States on a vast wall showing linked cities with roadways. And the politicians were so impressed by that 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 led to the American freeway. So we can blame our uh, his historic, historic design figures in some sense for contributing to this and being part of this picture. Do we have some other comments? Yes. There's, well, there's one at the back here first. I may be raising the 800 pound gorilla in the room, but we keep assuming that population growth has to continue. And I, I'm wondering if you're coming across any places where design is encouraging population reduction in not and, and I, I know it's sort of sacrosanct to talk about having children and growth and I know there are economic reasons for it as well but ultimately less people is less consumption right. and does design have anything to offer in that area well in the uh, Urban dwellers have fewer children than rural dwellers do. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the extra child has less economic utility in a, in a dense urban environment. And so uh, that's mildly uh, encouraging. And th there are, <clears throat> um, the Chinese have had the, you know, the, uh, the, the, one, the one child policy has actually been extraordinarily uh, effective, but hard to maintain. Uh, it's, but population is, a, uh, once again, I'm not really answering your question, but population is extraordinarily, it's kind of, it's amazing that population isn't, isn't, hasn't been an issue. And I think the reason it's not, it's hard in this country, it's, uh, it's sort of a hands-off issue, no matter where you fall on the political spectrum. Uh, for conservatives, it raises uh, uh, birth control, abortion, family, family issues. For liberals, it's, a, it's an immigration uh, issue, among other things. And the, as a result, uh, I think it, it doesn't get discussed in the, in the way that you think it would. Interesting to think about what, what 100 million more Americans in the next uh, 40 years, or 30 or 40 years would be. It would be the, uh, like adding the current populations of New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, Boston, Baltimore, Washington, and the next 200 uh, largest municipalities in the United States to, to the current population. Uh, what we need to do in this country is what we need to do everywhere is that if that growth takes place, and ideally it doesn't, uh, if it takes place to, to, to try to create incentives that cause it to take place in, in the places that can, where it does the least environmental damage to, to densify rather than continuing to sprawl. But population is very hard to talk about. You think in the population of, I read someplace that the the maximum sustainable population of the Earth is one and a half billion people uh, living very simply. One and a half billion is about what the population of the world was in uh, 1900. And I was thinking, you know, my grandmother was five then. It doesn't seem like so very long ago in history. But that's, you're talking, that's like, you know, it's a, it's a small fraction of the current population. I can think of people I could do without, but <laughs> the, you, you know, you think, well, I want, of course, I'll have my children, and I want grandchildren. And it, when you actually begin to try to think of what you do uh, to, to contain human population, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, and I'm thinking of healthcare and education and all those things that, that design actually can address. Yes. That might lead to population. 
Well, in a, in a more radical way, I suppose, um, you know, Carl Gerasi, the inventor or designer of the birth control pill, um, offers a, um, a designed solution to that <laughs> issue. <laughs> but they, from, a, from a global point of view, too, it's, it makes, it's, it's not just how many we produce, but where we place them. And uh, the, which is why immigration is a, is a, complete, is a completely untouchable uh, issue. But from the point of view of the Earth, more Canadians, Americans, and Australians, the big three in terms of, uh, of, of energy use and, uh, and, and overall environmental damage and uh, carbon output, the, 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 whether, we make, whether we make people at home or import, the, import them, we're, we're very, we're, we need to tighten up our emissions, our consumption in, in everywhere, because we, we, we are the, we're the, the villains. I don't know. Anyway, so it was a. Isn't very stressful living in a crowded city like New York. Yeah, there's a there's a big downside to urban life. There there's a there's a big upside. There's a big downside. I th and I think that the because of of this, there are if if we accept the idea that uh, that the right kind of density has environmental value, then uh, what we think of as environmental issues change. Uh, one of them is the stress that you talk about. One of them is, I think you can, my daughter is uh, 26. She lives in Manhattan, wouldn't live anywhere else. It's easy to persuade young people that uh, urban life is interesting and exciting. There's nothing she would hate more than living where my wife and I still live, where she grew up. Once. Uh, people begin to have families, then you get a host of issues, education, crime, space. And I think that is, it's that, that demographic chunk that is the, that propels us, that propels sprawl. At the other end of that scale, in the senior category, I could, my uh, other addiction besides golf is playing bridge, and mostly I play with uh, widows, and they, uh, in their 70s and 80s, and they all live in terror of the day when they lose their driver's license because when you live in outside the city, when you lose your driver's license, you're you're cut off from humanity. There's nothing you can do. And so I have one woman I play bridge with sometimes. She really can't see, but she still drives. And you just it's just, <laughs> just sort of you kind of cross your fingers when she gets into her car. When we lived in New York, there was an elderly woman in our building who really was able to live uh, on her own. Uh, until virtually until the day she died. She could walk to the grocery store, she could walk uh, to see friends, friends could come see her, she could walk to New York Hospital. I mean, it was, it was, it was around the corner. So I think that there, you know, if we package cities right, they're already appealing to some parts of, the, of, of our population. And the challenge is to address the issues that make city living seem to make the, to address the issues that drive us uh, out into the in places where we have no business being. And then I think in a kind of a paradoxical, a paradoxical perverse way, it, groups like the Sierra Club are in, share responsibility for sprawl because what the image that drives, the image that drove my wife and me out of the city, the image that drives people into the suburbs is this, this, this idea that your life is inauthentic unless you're in direct contact with, with, with green, with something green. Uh, and, and we don't, we haven't, um, we haven't treated city life in that same way with that same, we haven't given it the same imaginative power that this idea uh, of, of, you know, my own ground has. Even though when people, as I say, when people do that, when, if you go through the suburbs, you don't see people out enjoying their ground. They're inside watching, watching things on TV. Andrea, returning to the stress question, is uh, are there any, anything revealed in our research about whether it's more stressful to be in a favela than in Manhattan? Or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I don't have uh, any particular statistics on it, but I think Anecdotal all of us here can assume. can imagine. I mean, just in seeing some of some of the images, of course. Um, uh, 
that I showed earlier. However, I mean, one of the things that um, I would like to say as well, though, is that you know there are also a lot of people who take a lot of pride, you know, living in um, in these communities as well. I mean, this very much is a lifestyle, and these are, are their communities and, and the people that they know. So, um, you know, for as as much difficulty and whatnot as, as there there is in living in these communities, I mean, there there certainly is an upside um, and a positive spin to it as well. I think there's also the the problems of of human life don't go away when you spread people out. The problems just become harder to see. And sometimes by when you aggregate people, you not only reduce the size of some problems, but you also make the problems visible and make them addressable. And the sanitation difficulties in, in uh, informal communities, the, you know, the, these, the tremendous problems of access to fresh water, they're, they seem as though those, pro those problems seem, when you look at it, you seem this was created by this way of living. Well, it wasn't really. It was made visible by this, this way of organizing people. And the, the good thing is that the, the solutions can be concentrated too. But that's an entirely, that's an entirely different issue. The, having the will and the, the resources to solve those problems is a separate, is a separate one. Uh, I think that we shouldn't let images of, of, of this extraordinary squalor uh, make us think that the solution is to spread people out. And when you look at the problems of, of rural areas in, in those countries, there's a reason why all those people have come to cities. Right. Uh, it's to, uh, to try to, have, to scrape out some kind, of, some kind of life rather than, I was just reading about China now, by another New York, uh, a book by another New York co colleague, Country Driving, about uh, driving in China and talking about you know, uh, families on two hundredths of an acre plots you know, trying to uh, trying to f sustain themselves and their family on these tiny, tiny uh, plots. And there's, there's a reason why people migrate to the cities, but w we, we need to figure out how to, how to manage that. Yeah, I just, um, I've, I've read your book, and thanks very much for all the information. I think it's a tremendous eye-opening perspective on sustainability, um, a very different perspective. Um, if one were to try to, as a design problem, solve this and say, okay, well, to be very sustainable, everybody should live at the density of Manhattan and roll up the stuff that comes with the Hummer into a ni nice, neat little box. And I know that you've addressed this because you've been asked the question, why do you still live in the country? Right. But what? Is it a reverse design problem then to somehow figure out what to do with all the existing infrastructure that's out there in suburbia and other areas? Because there's already existing sprawl. Right. So if you can't, we, it's not as easy as just sort of rolling up the uh, sod and then densely packing it and saying, now we've solved the problem. So what, what, from a design perspective, and, and policy perspective, social perspective. What happens if you, is, is it possible to undo the suburbs? I don't think so. I think what the, and what, when I'm asked the question, why do you still live in the country, I usually stammer for about 30 seconds and then <laughs> say, but it's the, it, is the, it is the problem, which is that people are not gonna, leave, we're not gonna bulldoze suburban Atlanta, uh, which suburban Atlanta incidentally is half again as large, covers half again as much area as the state of Connecticut. Uh, I mean, metropolitan Atlanta. So what we have to do, I think, is encourage the growth that takes place to, to, take, to somehow create incentives that cause it to take place in the places where it does the least harm, where it does the most good, to densify, to, to, to infill, what people talk about, urban infill, to, to concentrate the places that are already concentrated in the hope of making them uh, achieving the sort of thresholds of density that make things like walking and public transit possible. But it's very difficult because there's so many forces that, that are arrayed against it. Uh, the, the one encouraging thing is that uh, in 2008 it actually happened. Uh, you know, if you go and, and you look at uh, Las Vegas, I, had, uh, I, was, I did a, an article for Golf Digest about water in Las Vegas. And I was shown around by a woman who said her family came to visit Las Vegas in 1974, and they said they, they said uh, the qu the question she had was, where do all the people who live who work in the hotels live? Where do the, all the people who live work in the casinos live? Because it just looks like there are these tall buildings, and then desert. 
no one who visits, has visited Las Vegas in the last 10 years would ask that question because Las Vegas spreads all the way across uh, the valley. I mean, just as far as you can see, you see these cookie cutter subdivisions. And there, it seemed like, what force on earth is there that will stop this outward expansion? Well, it stopped in 2008. Uh, the, and what stopped it was the price of oil and the implosion of the global economy. And that year, because of those two factors, something happened globally that nobody, not even the most opti optimistic environmentalist had been expecting, which was an actual uh, significant shrinkage in the global energy consumption and uh, carbon output. But what caused it was this crisis, and the, which we have ever since been trying to reverse. Uh, when the price of oil was high, the, the clamoring uh, in this country was to, we have to do something to drive the price of oil back down. We, we, we need to release uh, oil from the National Strategic Reserve. We need to stop taxing it at the state level. We need to do something to bring gasoline, make gasoline uh, affordable again. Uh, so all our political instincts tell us to fight the thing that causes us, the, the economic incentives that cause us to do the right thing. And then meanwhile, we, we, we're, when we set about solving our, uh, trying to solve our economic problems, we're mostly investing money in doing the things that get us into environmental trouble to begin with. Uh, I recently attended a lecture by a guy who was talking about uh, prosperity, without, or prosperity without growth, uh, which is a, a critical concept. What we really need is kind of uh, recession without pain. How do we shrink without uh, driving, you know, forcing everybody to jump off a cliff? So if somehow we need to, to uh, um, create incentives that cause growth to take place in, in more sustainable ways and discourage it from taking place in the, in the, in the, in the, auto, the totally automobile dependent ways. Right now we don't, re we don't really, people who drive don't pay the f full cost, don't perceive the full cost of their driving. And uh, the, uh, or any of our other, uh, the, any of the other environmental desecrations that we, that we commit. And uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a rational world, uh, we, would, we would see those costs. Uh, politically, I, you know, I, I have no idea how that is, can be accomplished. Um, both the images that you showed really gave me a great perspective. I've never seen anything like that before with the cars versus seeing the people. Oh, really that was it's really shocking. <laughs> very shocking. Um, and the statement that you made that the primary reaction that most Americans have when um, offered some sort of problem with the environment is, what, what could I buy instead? And that idea of being a consumer and having that consumer desire to, to want to help but best way to help is to buy something. Mm -hmm. what are de how are designers thinking about that? And what sort of, um, I don't know, education is the right word, but what sort of ideas would they be able to share with the American people who tend to consume a lot as, and, and sort of help them have other alternatives besides purchasing things? Or another way to say it is, when you're designing something, how, how are you thinking about consumption? This is a mm -hmm. question for Andrea and Bill. But it's it's huge, and and, and we're all it's. Uh, I'm a total hypocrite on on this and so, as on so many other issues because I want people to uh, continue manufacturing things that advertise in the magazines that I write for, and uh, to continue purchasing my books. And we can all it, I I've, I can if we all had to you know. There's lots of talk about green jobs. Well, I can my job is a green job now because I just gave this talk. It's all easy. We can all easily sort of repackage ourselves as, as green people. It's very hard to take the next step and actually accomplish something. And it's, and it's very hard for a designer because what you're, it's, you can't, it's hard to design not buying something. Right. And uh, same for architects. It's hard to, uh, how can an architect, it's not really the solar panels and all, all this. It's, it's stuff that doesn't, it's other, other things that are the problem. And so it's, yeah. uh, it's, 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 it is, it, it definitely is a challenge. It would be a very in, small exhibit in a museum. It, it would be a small exhibit <laughs> in a museum. Oh, me, perhaps not, though. You know, actually, Saul Griffith, going back to him, he um, has mentioned this idea about heirloom design, for instance, and that certainly would be, you know, one way to design to discourage consumption is when you actually create something that you want to hold on to and you don't need to replace. 
um, is he certainly said, one said, way in that fact, you can. Saul said that he's, every every person should be issued at birth a uh, Mount Blanc pen and a uh, <laughs> I don't know a uh, some fa a fancy watch with the idea you know like here's your pen don't <laughs> lose it and <laughs> even when I was even when I was in high school I had I remember I had an orange bit click pen I remember I think I had it all through high school and I would buy a refill for it nobody does that now mm -hmm. you buy a box of two dozen pens and then just like mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I think there is a here. kind of, you know, <laughs> there's a simple design philosophy about uh, using things rather than owning them. And you can, if you sort of define yourself as you are what you use rather than what you own, that does help shift the attitude towards thinking in that way. So, for example, instead of having three cars, which we used to have when we were in California, we now are members of Zipcar and we use the subway and the bus. So we're, we're actually contributing to the things that we need to do to move around, um, but we're not owning them. And that kind of philosophy does make a bit of difference. I think there's another one here. Thanks. I guess picking up on that, uh, uh, part of a designer's job is to, is to uh, inspire people to value this idea that you just brought up, which is membership. So that you're, you're as proud of being a member in Zipcar as you are of owning a car. Uh, and in some ways, prouder, because you're part of a, of a community. So just to pick up on that. Um, what, a, what an amazing evening. Thank you all. Um, I was inspired by this, this notion of the thresholds in life, that when you're young, you want to get to New York City or to a metropolis, and you're, you're seeking out density, and that when you're older, you really need that density back. Um, and I think part of a designer's challenge <coughs> is to try and make imageable and aspirational um, that middle part, perhaps, because designers and, and magazines work very hard at making these the, the, the dense places very desirable to young people. They do it through television shows like, you know, Friends and, um, and just all sorts of just pumping our culture th with, uh, um, again, images and, 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 um, and ideas and contexts that say, I want to get there. Um, and and, and this, this is very primal what you had talked about, that, you know, unless I'm touching green when I have kids, you know, I have one child in New York City, she's eight. Um, people say, how can you raise a child in New York City? And I said, well, there's just so much to do, and we don't have to like, live in a car. And, and these, are, these are good arguments, but there's still something in me. It's just like, we right. don't have a backyard. I can't, she, just, she never goes out and plays you know, out of our sight. It's, it's tough to, to reconcile. Um, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that's a critical environmental issue, because that's, that's what sends young families out of, out of cities. That and uh, concerns about schools and concerns about crime. And just the fact that uh, uh, what my wife said to a friend of ours who has a young child, which is, in New York, you can't just go, go outside, you know, <laughs> get out of here. And that's not really an option that's available, available to you in, in the city. You know, I, should, I should aspire to that kind of parent. <laughs> 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 that so but, New York has actually done, I think New York has in recent years done, uh, I made, I, I, uh, I got some, I elicited some angry questions by saying that I didn't think Central Park was a well-designed park. Uh, and, and I don't think it is. I think it's a, I think it's more, creates more problems for the city than it solves. And one of the examples I gave is that if you put somebody at Grand Central State Station and tell them to, to go to Times Square, they'll walk. They'll, you know, you're standing there, Lexington Avenue, they'll walk. It, it's three quarters of a mile. If you put somebody on uh, East 64th Street and tell them to walk, to, to, to go to Lincoln Center, they'll get in a cab yeah. because it seems farther. And the, I see it in my town, there's, it, you know, from the grocery store to, there's a grocery store and there's a bookstore and it's like 100 yards. People will drive from one to the other because there's very little between them. And no one, no one in the history of New York City has ever taken a cab 100 yards. So there are, there are perceptions. There are, well, they certainly haven't taken the subway. Maybe they've taken a cab. But they're, they're, those, are, those, are, uh, those are powerful things. But I think that, uh, and then also, if it all works, if suddenly cities become very desirable, then you face the, pro the, the sort of the mirror image of the problem of the 50s, which is instead of suburban flight, you have urban flight, and you push the least privileged people to the outer edges, which we actually saw in the part of the, uh, uh, the subprime mortgage crisis. The places that were hardest hit were the, 
the drive till you qualify suburbs, the, the, the ones farthest away, the, the, the ones with the longest commute, uh, the people who, who in order to qualify, for the, in order to get the house, had to go the farthest away, and they were the most vulnerable, and they, and, and they were wiped out. So I, I think you, if in, in, my, in my utopia, there's this horrible dystopian part that you can't look at, which is all the people who are driven out into the old suburbs. Well, in, in one sense, um, you know, I think we've heard of a lot of challenges and things that um, are worrying or dysfunctional or difficult. Um, but at the same time, I, I like to thank them both and thank David because he's made me feel good about a couple of things. <laughs> First is that, um, you know, I came here and that's good to be living in Manhattan. And then there's this thing about the recession having been a good thing. To, so thank you yeah. for that as well. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.